people stop their cars on the highway, get out of them, and lift their heads in wonder. In the cities, everyone takes to the streets. Balconies and rooftops of houses are full of people staring at the moon in shock. It's red. Some people scream that it's the end of the world. Some seek shelter. Indeed, the usual white moon now looks like it's been doused in red paint. There's no need to be afraid if you see such a thing. On the contrary, enjoy the view, because you have witnessed a rare astronomical phenomenon. This is a total lunar eclipse. Here's the Sun. It's in the center of our solar system. Mercury, Venus, and here's Earth and the Moon. The Earth takes 365 days to orbit around the star. At the same time, the Moon revolves around the Earth and completely orbits our planet in 27 days. The Earth creates a shadow zone, and sometimes the Moon passes through it. The shadow is cone-shaped and gradually narrows. The Moon is 238,000 miles away. That's like nine lengths of the equator. At this distance, the width of the shadow is about 2.6 times the width of the Moon. When the Moon is in this zone, direct sunlight doesn't reach it. That is, it should have disappeared, but instead, it becomes red. All because the Sun's rays pass through the Earth's atmosphere. They scatter, and most of the blue light disappears. But the red and orange rays continue and hit the surface of the Moon. Voila! You see a phenomenon called the Blood Moon. By the way, this curvature of light occurs at sunsets and dawns. The atmosphere scatters the blue light, and you see a red and orange sky. If you were standing on the surface of the Moon during a total lunar eclipse, planet Earth would be exactly between you and the Sun. So, you would be able to observe the solar eclipse. The surface of the Earth would become entirely dark for you. All you'd see would be the Sun's corona illuminating the edges of the planet. The Earth from the surface of the Moon is almost the same size as the Moon from the surface of the Earth. Such a red eclipse of the Moon is rare because several factors must coincide. One of them is that the Moon must be full. Usually, you can see two total lunar eclipses a year. In 2038, you'll be able to see four such eclipses. And the eclipse itself can last up to 108 minutes. But this is rare, and the last time such a long blood moon was seen was in 2000. Many years ago, people didn't know so many facts about our satellite, and the sight of a red moon frightened them. It was a bad sign and a harbinger of trouble. People who knew the schedule of eclipses could take advantage of it. For example, Christopher Columbus had an astronomical almanac and knew when the next lunar eclipse would occur. He frightened the inhabitants of the Caribbean islands when he predicted the red moon. Once upon a time, the moon used to be a red ball of lava. This was way back in time, 4.5 billion years ago. Now this is our solar system. It's full of dust and asteroids. They're constantly bumping into each other, playing space billiards. This is Earth. It's just beginning to cool off from the constant asteroid and comet impacts. But then, Theia appears on the horizon, a planet the size of Mars. It had a chaotic orbit and was approaching Earth in a spiral. A collision was inevitable, and at one point, one of the biggest crashes in our solar system occurred. Theia struck the Earth at an angle. It ripped out part of the Earth's crust and threw it into space. The Earth, in turn, absorbed part of the planet that rammed it. The debris from the collision circled the Earth for a long time. They were a kind of ring, almost like Saturn's. Debris in orbit collided and piled up around a common center of gravity. And that's how the Earth got the Moon. There's a theory that this collision helped give birth to life on our planet. Theia hit the Earth at a perfect angle. If the crash had been head-on, both planets would likely have been destroyed in a massive explosion. If the impact had been tangential, then there wouldn't have been enough debris in Earth's orbit to form the Moon. But we got the lucky ticket. The Moon stabilized the Earth's rotation. The collision shattered the planet's solid crust and allowed oceans to form. Remember, water is the basis of life. When the cores of Earth and Theia merged, we got a powerful magnetosphere. This protects all living organisms from solar radiation. The Moon, along with the Sun, controls the tides. Its gravity seems to draw water to it from the Earth's surface. 
the sun does the same thing. That is, if we imagine the Earth as a ball of water, there would be two mountains, one on the moon's side and one on the sun's side. And as the moon moves around the Earth, this mountain of water moves with it. If you were in the open ocean with a tape measure, you would see that the moon is attracting water to itself by about four to six inches. The moon is gravitationally locked with the Earth. That's why it's always turned to us with one side, like Mercury and the sun. But the moon doesn't stand still. It's gradually moving away from our planet, about 1.5 inches a year. Not quickly, but in about 600 million years, it will have shrunk in our sky so much that we won't be able to see lunar eclipses anymore. Do you see this crater? It's Tycho. It's visible during a full moon because of these bright rays that extend thousands of miles from its epicenter. This is the youngest crater on the moon. Scientists say it appeared there due to a meteorite impact about 109 million years ago. At that time, dinosaurs were roaming the surface of our planet, and they may have seen the impact. It was most likely accompanied by a big explosion and looked like a salute in the night sky. Humanity loves to explore the moon. We've sent a bunch of missions there. A total of 12 people have set foot on the surface of the moon. The gravitational force there is six times less than on Earth. So if the average person on our planet weighed about 180 pounds, on the surface of the moon, the scales would only show 30 pounds, like the weight of an average dog. That's why the astronauts moved, jumped, and fell so strangely there. And you would be six times stronger on the surface of the moon. Here on Earth, the average person could lift about 130 pounds. But on the moon, you could raise a big motorcycle or a grizzly bear. The surface of the moon is covered with regolith. This is the lunar dust that covers the solid ground. Such dust is good at preserving footprints. Here's the most famous footprint which gave birth to many crazy theories. Here's the footprint, and here's the shoe that left it. But the shoe is completely flat. This is explained simply. The astronauts wore extra boots for walking on the lunar surface. They have exactly the kind of sole that left these marks. In addition to the footprints, we left many fascinating objects on the moon. Several lunar rovers, a golf ball, flags, and human waste. There's also a lot of broken satellites and rocket parts. All in all, about 413,000 pounds of human-made objects are there. That's the weight of three passenger planes, or 31 adult elephants. In the future, we plan to resume missions to the moon. New landers will explore the surface of our satellite to find natural resources there. It's also a great place to test new rovers. We're even going to build something like the International Space Station in the moon's orbit the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway. It'll be a convenient platform for exploring our satellite and launching spacecraft into distant space. If you start from here, the spacecraft won't need to spend almost all its fuel to overcome the force of Earth's gravity. So such a station would save fuel and money. Scientists hope that we'll be able to mine water from the moon's surface. It's been proven that there's ice there, mostly at the bottom of craters where the sunlight doesn't reach. Perhaps we'll send a rover there that can drill down a few feet into the surface, searching for water. Humanity already has the technology to build a full-fledged colony there. It would take up to three days to get there. We just need to get enough solar panels and building materials to the moon. There's no atmosphere on the moon, so potential lunar inhabitants would be defenseless against solar radiation. We would have to build houses underground to provide protection. Modern 3D printers will help make construction easy and fast. However, food and water supplies can only be maintained by constant supplies from Earth. The same goes for oxygen. Each rocket launch costs millions of dollars, so for now, colonization of the moon is in question. The moon could also become an object for space tourism. Imagine a spaceship launches from Earth, three days on the road, and you're orbiting the moon. The lunar module undocks, and you land on the surface. You ride the rover, explore the craters, then return to the lander. The engines start, the lander returns you to orbit. You dock with the ship and return to Earth. Sounds like some pretty great plans for a week's vacation. So tonight, go out and look at the moon through a telescope and you'll see many craters. 
No one still knows how they appeared there. Some of them have formed recently. Scientists have discovered a double crater on the moon that appeared for a strange reason. In March, a rocket crashed into the moon, and no one knows who owned it and why it left such a trail. If a regular rocket had fallen there, it would have left one hole. A standard space rocket has a heavy engine on one side and a lighter fuel tank on the other. But this time, there had to be two heavy sides on one rocket to leave a double crater. That's strange. No one knows what it is, and no one has claimed to be the owner. It was probably part of a large three-ton rocket. This piece had been flying in space for several years. At first, astronomers thought it belonged to SpaceX, but the company denied this claim. Also, they thought that China had launched the rocket. But this was also wrong. In the near future, NASA experts hope to find out the truth. The problem with tracking such rockets and space debris is that this is quite expensive. Companies don't want to spend too much money on it. But soon, this will change. People will have to spend billions of dollars to monitor garbage or destroy it, since it's getting too crowded in space. Space companies will have to solve this problem, as it poses a serious danger to satellites and spacecraft. Just take a look. There are millions of pieces of satellites and rockets flying in space. Some of them are the size of a basketball, others are as tiny as a raindrop. The total weight of all this debris is about 9,000 tons. This is almost 2,000 tons heavier than the Eiffel Tower. Okay, all this garbage is floating there, so what? The problem is that it's not just floating. It's moving at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. A tennis ball will fall apart into several pieces at such a speed on the surface of our planet because of air resistance. But there's no air in space. Nothing prevents a tiny piece of metal from reaching a speed 20 times faster than the speed of sound. A piece of paint at this speed can easily damage the casing of a spaceship. Once, several shuttle portholes were replaced because of the damage caused by flying chunks of paint. Now imagine what a piece of metal the size of a basketball can do to a spaceship. It could bring down the International Space Station. Many satellites were destroyed by space debris that crashed into them. And when those satellites exploded, they burst into thousands of small parts, which also turned into dangerous flying objects. For example, in 1996, a fragment of a rocket damaged 10 years earlier crashed into a French satellite. In 2009, a failed spacecraft destroyed another commercial ship. As a result of the collision, about 2,300 tracked fragments appeared, as well as lots of tiny untracked ones. Today, satellite operators receive warnings about potential collisions with space debris. But these messages are often either inaccurate or reach the operators too late. Imagine that a screw is flying at great speed toward your satellite. You'll hardly have time to dodge it. Perhaps it won't hit your satellite at all. This uncertainty makes these warning sensors useless. The problem becomes much more serious when it concerns the ISS crew members. A durable spacesuit can't guarantee protection from flying debris. And the station itself is too large to save itself from big objects by dodging. To keep astronauts safe, scientists have a catalog of things that are the size of softballs or bigger. They monitor thousands of fragments and analyze their trajectories, material, and dimensions. Next, they use the pizza box method to dodge garbage. This is the unofficial name for an imaginary square that is used to calculate the risks of a collision with space debris. So imagine a giant pizza box. It is 2.5 miles deep, 30 miles wide, and 30 miles long. Now put the entire International Space Station in this box. Yeah, okay, you can have it with pepperoni. Anyway, if some space object is heading toward the edge of the box, the crew will begin to develop a plan of action. The box's radius is quite large compared to the station, since it's difficult to calculate the debris's trajectory. If there's a chance that something might approach the box, then it can also damage the station. When operators receive a signal about approaching debris, they analyze it. Depending on the data received, the crew begins to act in a certain way. If it's something small and heading for some part of the ISS, the astronaut should evacuate from this part. And after that, they'll do repairs there. If something big is approaching, the entire station can perform an evasive maneuver with the help of the engines or a docked spacecraft. 
one such trick required about five hours of hard work. The station is a big clumsy ship, so it's important to know about the threat in advance. From 1999 to 2020, the ISS made 29 maneuvers to avoid collisions. Three of them occurred in 2020. And there will be more since the amount of garbage increases. If some object is too big and fast and can damage critical components, and it's impossible to dodge, the entire crew will have to evacuate. In the future, NASA and other space agencies will have to think about how to destroy this debris or remove it from orbit. One option is catching everything with extensive space nets. One agency suggested developing a solar sail that clings to debris and propels it to a low orbit. Another wanted to use an electrodynamic cable to slow down the speed of space debris with the current. This maneuver will cause space garbage to move toward the surface of Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. But what if one of these pieces still reaches the ground? Even now, many satellite parts fall on Earth. Fortunately, this is not so dangerous. The probability of cosmic garbage falling on your house is minimal. In addition, 70% of our planet is covered with water. Of the remaining 30%, only 3-10% to are occupied by people. Almost all space debris falls into the ocean or unpopulated parts of dry land. But let's say some part of a satellite damages your property. In that case, the company that owns this space object will cover the losses. Such cases are rare and occur because of accidents in orbit. But sometimes, companies intentionally abandon their satellites. If a spacecraft is out of order, they turn it off and use the remaining fuel to slow it out of orbit and drop it in a safe place. Almost all such objects fall in the region of the spacecraft cemetery. It's located at the most remote point on Earth, Point Nemo. It's in the southern Pacific Ocean, east of New Zealand. The nearest island is more than a thousand miles away. The distance to the International Space Station is much smaller. It's challenging to get to this place since no ships travel there. That's why most satellites end up in that area. It looks like an endless sea. The ocean there absorbs explosive waves of any power without consequences. Even if some fallen ship or rocket causes a giant wave, it dissipates long before it reaches dry land. Fish and other marine creatures are also not at risk. Point Nemo is one of the least inhabited areas on Earth. Underwater currents carry nutrients through the ocean, and tiny living creatures such as photoplankton and other organisms feed on them. But these currents don't reach Point Nemo. Another way to deliver nutrients in the ocean is wind. But there's almost no wind at Point Nemo. This place doesn't have enough food to let large life forms develop. Just imagine how lonely and silent it is there. Sometimes, a broken rocket breaks the silence, crashing into the water at great speed and descending to the seabed, where thousands of other satellites are waiting to welcome it. People haven't set foot on the moon in several decades, but the situation is going to change soon. NASA's Artemis program is going to send a few missions to Earth's natural satellite. The first astronauts might step on the surface of the moon already in 2025, as part of Artemis 3, if the current schedule holds, that is. And then the next stage will start, and it will be an even more ambitious project than sending humans to the moon again. NASA wants to construct a base camp at our satellite's south pole. Such an outpost will help the Artemis mission to break the previous record for the longest stay on the moon. So far, it's 74 hours, 59 minutes, and 38 seconds. Plus, such a camp can serve as a jumping-off point for missions setting off for deep space. According to NASA, at first, it's going to be a small camp, accommodating missions for a week or two. But soon, it'll grow in size and complexity, and will be able to sustain crews for a couple of months at a time. There might also be an open-top rover similar to the one used in the Apollo missions and an RV. These options can provide mobility for astronauts while they live and work at the camp. With each new trip, the level of comfort of space explorers will increase. Specialists are now developing the technologies that will help people to work more easily on the moon, far away from home. There's also hope that building such a camp can help us prepare for an even more challenging step, human exploration of Mars. 
for the camp to function properly. It's very important to be able to find and extract resources from the satellite's rocks and dust. These resources can include water ice, metals, oxygen, and even some building materials. It'll help to lighten the load with supplies delivered to the moon. It can also potentially allow astronauts to remain there for longer periods of time. Now, why the Lunar South Pole? There are two very important reasons. First, building the base camp there will allow astronauts to have periods of continuous light from the sun. The moon is tilted in such a way that its south pole experiences up to two months of continuous light every year, when the sun is circling above the horizon all the time. And all this abundant sunlight can provide the camp with a lot of solar power. At the moment, NASA is trying to design a solar array that could stay more than 30 feet in the air. This way, it'll be able to make the most of the available sunlight. The second reason for choosing this location is deep craters that have been shrouded in darkness for billions of years, also because of the moon's peculiar tilt. Some of these craters haven't seen sunlight since the time of their formation. They're also known as permanently shadowed regions. And that's where scientists have found evidence of water ice. If we manage to access this frozen water and it turns out there's a lot of it there, it'll be hugely valuable for the inhabitants of the base camp. Plus, it might supply flights back to Earth or further on to Mars. We don't know yet whether there's a lot of water in that region or whether it's free of contaminants. But NASA is going to find out. One of the ways to do it is to use Viper. This mobile robot is likely to arrive at the Lunar South Pole in 2024. The Lunar Terrain Vehicle, or LTV for short, is scheduled to arrive on a mission in 2025. Astronauts will be able to operate it remotely, and it's likely to be able to avoid such hazards as rocks and craters on its own. Astronauts will then explore their surroundings either from the safety of the lander on earlier missions or, later on, from the base camp itself. Plus, NASA will use the LTV to conduct scientific or mission-related work even during periods of time when there will be no humans on the moon. The vehicle will play a crucial role in searching for water ice and other resources. But even though the LTV's remote-controlled capabilities are quite innovative, its design isn't going to change much. It'll look almost like the rovers that have come before it. If astronauts decide to drive the vehicle with its top open, they will have to put on their spacesuits, and that's not very comfortable. Donning such a suit can easily take hours. Plus, the duration of missions always depends on how much oxygen each astronaut's spacesuit has left. That's where NASA's RV-like concept, known as the Habitable Mobility Platform, comes into play. If this project succeeds, the RV will have a pressurized interior and life support systems, meaning passengers will be able to have a ride without their spacesuits on. This will definitely make life easier for astronauts. The final design of the vehicle isn't ready yet, but the main goal is to allow several people to live and work inside the vehicle for up to two weeks. Now, let's have a look at what the future lunar cabin might look like. Its design hasn't been finalized either, but NASA is looking at modular and inflatable structures. It may help to create larger spaces for crews to live in. Plus, such kinds of structures are more compact and lightweight, so it will be easier to transport them to the moon. But there's one more intriguing possibility. How about a large-scale 3D printer that will use lunar soil and rock as its raw material? Such a machine might be able to produce bricks and other shapes, assembling dwellings from scratch. A prototype 3D printer is now building a test structure in Houston. Also, the first towns on the moon could probably be built in craters. They might be covered with protective materials, like plastic, reinforced with a net made of titanium and UV-resistant superfiber. The inhabitants would have to access their homes through airlock entrances dug into a mound. Bilbo Baggins would surely appreciate their aesthetics. On the moon, gravity is way weaker than on our home planet. And while it can make it easier for astronauts to walk and even run on the moon's surface, it's not so great in the long run. That's why inside the lunar base, there might be an artificial gravitational field. Without it, people would have problems with coordination, balance, and orientation in space. Plus, weight-bearing bones would lose 1 to 5% of mineral density per month. A geologist from the University of Notre Dame 
who's been studying samples of lunar soil, says that rocks or dust may have a key role in protecting astronauts from radiation coming from solar flares and cosmic rays. On Earth, the planet's atmosphere and its magnetic field filter out most of this harmful radiation. But the Moon doesn't have the same shield because there's no atmosphere like on our planet there. The very weak one that our natural satellite has is made up of some unusual gases that haven't been found in the atmosphere of Earth, Mars, or Venus. That's why people working there will need extra protection. The experts say that up to six feet of lunar material might be needed to shield astronauts from the radiation. But besides building materials and water, there's another crucial resource on the Moon and its oxygen. NASA hopes to start extracting this gas from moon rocks. They also hope to find metals like aluminum. This could allow astronauts to live off the land, and the base would become much more self-sufficient than expected. It could turn into a resupply station for spaceships heading for Mars. But a colony on Mars would cost us trillions of dollars to construct and inhabit. It would take a long time for even one cargo ship to reach the red planet. Lunar camps are much easier to build and maintain. There will likely be direct spaceship routes connecting the satellite with Earth. And people will need just three days to travel between these two points. That's one of the reasons the colonies on the Moon will be growing, developing, and changing non-stop. Do you know that these days our planet has not one, but several moons? Well, kind of. Astronomers have recently discovered another moon orbiting Earth. But it's not what you might be imagining. It's actually an asteroid trailing along beside our planet in a complex semi-orbit. The asteroid was named 2023 FW13, and instead of simply orbiting our planet like the Moon does, it orbits the Sun. But its orbit is so unusual that it causes the asteroid to circle Earth too, keeping it in roughly the same area as our planet, even though it doesn't orbit it directly. You've probably already realized that 2023 FW13 isn't the kind of moon where we could send a mission. It's way smaller and farther away than our natural satellite. The newly found space object is a mere 50 feet across and is floating 9 million miles away. And that's when it's the closest to Earth. This distance is around 35 times as great as that between our planet and the moon. On the other hand, cosmically speaking, it's just next door. For the first time, the quasi-moon was spotted by astronomers at the Pan-STARRS Observatory on Haleakala in Hawaii in March 2023. Now, a quasi-moon is a space object which shares a similar orbital path with a planet, even though it doesn't orbit this planet directly. Plus, it has a steady relative position to this planet. True moons always keep a relatively consistent distance from their parent planet, but quasi-moons have more complex paths. That's because of the combined gravitational influences of the Sun and the planet itself. Quasi-moons usually have horseshoe or tadpole-like orbits. To put it simply, you can see them travel ahead or behind a planet when it orbits the Sun. Such an orbit is truly unusual, and it occurs because the gravitational pull between the Sun, the planet, and the quasi-moon results in a complex dynamic, leading to a delicate balance in the trajectory of the quasi-moon. When a quasi-moon moves ahead of a planet, it tends to slow down with time, and in the end it falls behind because of the gravitational influence of the planet. Similarly, when a quasi-moon falls behind at first, it later starts speeding up and begins to move ahead of the planet. This is what creates that horseshoe shape if you look at this dance from a fixed point in space. At the same time, the orbit will look like a tadpole from the perspective of the planet. Scientists love quasi-moons because they present great research possibilities. Their interesting orbits make them perfect for studying gravitational influences and the intricacies of space mechanics. Plus, they're usually close to their parent planets, which can also offer insights into the formation and evolution of planetary systems. And who knows, maybe at one point in the future, they'll help us with space exploration. Missions to such quasi-moons could give us important information about different celestial bodies and help with the exploration of the solar system. But let's get back to our tiny moon. While it's still being studied, current data suggests that 2023 FW13 entered its current orbit at least 2,100 years ago. 
And according to simulations based on preliminary orbital calculations, the quasi-moon will accompany Earth for another 1,700 years or so. The good news is that the asteroid won't end up on a collision course with Earth, despite traveling relatively close to our planet. A few years ago, another asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel along with our planet. No larger than an average car, it was still a big deal. Out of more than 1 million asteroids astronomers know about, it was only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it became our temporary mini-moon. It wasn't going to stay with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. 2020 CD3 will make another close pass to Earth in March 2044, though it will most likely not be caught by Earth again because of the greater approach distance. Temporarily captured objects, such as this one, are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be captured by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. And in 2016, astronomers discovered another space rock and called it Kamo'oalewa. There was one absolutely amazing thing about this space traveler. Astronomers suspect that this celestial body could have formed after splitting off the moon during an ancient collision with an asteroid. Yes, it means it might be a piece of our moon. When specialists examined the space body and analyzed its composition, the results didn't match any of the more than 2,000 near-Earth asteroids studied before. Kamo'oalewa was too tiny and too far away for regular telescopes to study it. That's why the researchers had to find a more powerful telescope to learn more about this unusual find. After using the Large Binocular Telescope, one of the largest optical telescopes in America, and the Infrared Lowell Discovery Telescope, the scientists finally figured out what the asteroid was made of, and what they had discovered surprised them. The asteroid had light spectra similar to those of the samples of lunar material delivered to Earth by the 1960s and 1970s Apollo missions. Astronomers admit that there might be other asteroids with the same spectra, but so far, they haven't found anything like that. Kamaoalewa is another quasi-satellite of our planet. Its orbit is a bit tilted and slightly elongated. So the rock keeps leaping ahead and then falling behind Earth. In other words, it performs constant loops around us. At its closest, the 130-foot-wide asteroid gets to the distance of around 40 times that of the Moon. According to the results of orbital analysis, the rock has been following Earth for at least 100 years. We found more than 480 lunar meteorites on our planet. It may mean that pieces of our natural satellite travel through space pretty regularly. And Kamaoalewa might as well just be the first discovered large rock split off the moon as a result of an ancient collision. Now we've already talked about quasi-moons. Let's find out more about asteroids. These space bodies are often called minor planets or planetoids. They're usually rocky leftovers from the early formation of our solar system that occurred around 4.6 billion years ago. They are mainly found in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Asteroids can be very different in size, from tiny dust particles and modestly sized boulders to huge bodies reaching 600 miles across. Asteroids often have irregular shapes, especially smaller ones. At the same time, large space bodies can have more of a spherical shape. Unlike planets, asteroids don't consist of layers. They're made of different kinds of metals and rocks and have no atmosphere. Funnily enough, some asteroids have moons of their own. And there are even asteroid binaries where two asteroids of similar size orbit each other. The asteroid belt located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter has the largest number of asteroids in our solar system. There are millions of space rocks there of various shapes and sizes. But despite such a huge number of asteroids, they're widespread across the vastness of the cosmos. And if you accidentally wandered into that region, the chances of your spacecraft colliding with an asteroid would be quite low. But even though most asteroids prefer to stay in the asteroid belt, some of them make their way closer to Earth. Those are called near-Earth asteroids. Experts monitor such asteroids because of the potential risk they pose. In the past, they did affect our planet. Think of that large one that most likely wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. 
NASA and other international space agencies have sent a few missions to research asteroids. Some of them aim to retrieve samples from asteroids and return them to Earth for study. Picture this. It's a warm summer evening. You're a tired adventurer traveling through the Grand Canyon. Suddenly, you stumble upon a place that seems straight out of a sci-fi movie. The Cinder Hills Off-Highway Vehicle Area in Northern Arizona. With its cinder cones and craters, the landscape resembles a mishmash of a volcanic eruption and a meteor strike. But this unique terrain was actually a result of the ingenious efforts of the United States Geological Survey and NASA. They painstakingly recreated a part of the moon's Sea of Tranquility, a smooth landing spot for Apollo 11 in 1969. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? Well, what if I told you that there are many fantastic destinations like that here on Earth? From astronaut training playgrounds to space-themed amusement parks, these extraordinary places offer an earthly twist on interstellar exploration. So let's take a look at some of them. First, Arizona's Bonito Lava Flow. Just a short distance away from the Cinder Hills, you'll find the Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument. It was actually used as a training site for astronauts. Back in the groovy 1970s, Commander Gene Cernan and geologist Jack Schmidt practiced here before their epic Apollo 17 mission. Their goal was to discover signs of volcanic activity on the moon. To prepare for their lunar voyage, the two brave astronauts explored the rugged Bonita lava flow along with the surrounding cinder fields and cones. They tested their equipment and practiced some awesome geological survey techniques. During their first spacewalk, or as astronauts like to call it, extravehicular activity, they mostly found breccias. Those are rocks formed by meteorite impacts that created the moon's mountains. But halfway through their second adventure, Schmidt couldn't contain his excitement when he stumbled upon something extraordinary. Orange soil! Turns out, they had discovered traces of volcanic glass. The prevailing theory was that billions of years ago, the moon was a wild and fiery place. Lava on there burst from its low-gravity surface, shooting high into the sky before showering down as tiny grains of mesmerizing orange glass. Fast forward to today, and you have the chance to explore the amazing Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument. It's a fantastic way to get a taste of the lunar environment that once fooled astronauts into thinking they were on the moon. Next, get ready to witness the coolest meteor shower in Arizona. Picture this. 50,000 years ago, a ginormous meteor, about 150 feet wide, decided to make a grand entrance into our atmosphere. It zoomed in at a staggering speed of 26,000 miles per hour. When it finally crashed into Arizona, it created an incredible crater that's three quarters of a mile wide and a whopping 700 feet deep. And now, here is the Meteor Crater, the ultimate meteor impact site on Earth. Fast forward to today, and you have the awesome Behringer Space Museum sitting right on the edge of the crater. You can soak in the incredible views from various viewpoints. You can even take a guided tour along the rim. Step inside the museum and you'll learn all about how this epic crater came to be and explore meteor impacts from around the world. Oh, and don't forget to check out the star of the show, the Holzinger Meteorite. It's the largest piece ever found from the meteor that crashed and created this crater. It's a close encounter you won't want to miss. But let's move on to New Mexico. This state is making some serious space history. In May 2021, it became the third place in the entire United States to send people into space, following in the footsteps of Florida and California. And the epicenter of all this excitement is none other than New Mexico's very own Spaceport America. In 2021, Richard Branson became one of the passengers on the very first commercial space flight ever. And guess where it launched from and landed? Yep, this spaceport. It's the new home of groundbreaking space tourism. You can visit it and get a first-hand look at all the space magic happening there. 
just head to the Spaceport America Visitor Center in the nearby town of Truth or Consequences and join one of their super popular guided tours. Depending on what's going on at the Spaceport, the tour will take you to incredible places like the Operations Center, the Fire Station, and even the Runway and Hangar, where you might catch a glimpse of the incredible Virgin Galactic Space Planes. Sounds like a great adventure! Next, we'll move to Pittsburgh. A brand new museum called the Moonshot Museum opened its doors in late 2022. They're super hyped about NASA's upcoming return to the moon with the amazing Artemis program. But here's what sets this museum apart. It's actually located in the same building as Astrobotic Technology, an aerospace company. And they have a special treat for you. Imagine this. There's a wall of windows that lets you peek right into the Astrobotic Workshop. It's like having a VIP pass to see the magic happening right before your eyes. Just a few feet away, you'll spot technicians and engineers hard at work building and testing robotic spacecraft. These incredible machines are directly involved in supporting the Artemis missions. One exciting project they're currently working on is the Griffin Lander. This mighty lander will touch down on the moon's surface and deliver the Artemis rover Viper, who will embark on a thrilling quest to search for frozen water. Talk about an important mission! What's even cooler is that these robotic sidekicks, unlike in the past with programs like Apollo, are going to play an even bigger role in future human exploration beyond Earth's orbit. They'll scout out landing sites, set up infrastructure for lunar bases, and so much more. Isn't that awesome? The Moonshot Museum hopes that this glimpse into the workings of a real-life clean room will ignite a spark of curiosity and passion for space exploration. They want young visitors to dream big and maybe even consider a career in the space industry one day. The next generation of space explorers might just be inspired right here, in this very museum. So make sure to swing by and get a front row seat to the space action. And finally, get ready for the rocket show in Virginia. There's this super cool place called NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. It's situated on a groovy island just off the coast of Delmarva Peninsula. And it's not your ordinary airfield. It's an action-packed flight test spot and a rocket launch site. Since 1945, Wallops has witnessed thousands of incredible rocket launches. It was also the stage for two historic test flights during Project Mercury, starring two very special astronauts, monkeys named Sam and Miss Sam. Sam and Miss Sam strapped themselves into a capsule perched atop a Little Joe rocket. In December 1959, Sam embarked on an epic adventure, soaring to an altitude of 55 miles, right near the edge of space. And a month later, it was Miss Sam's turn to shine. She tested the launch escape system's capabilities, proving that it's possible to safely bail out if something goes wrong. Both brave monkeys landed like pros in the mighty Atlantic Ocean and were rescued by helicopters. Their successful missions paved the way for NASA's first human launches in 1961. Fast forward to today, and Wallops has a visitor center where you can geek out on all the awesome stuff happening there. You'll find exhibits that showcase the facility's incredible efforts, like resupplying astronauts aboard the International Space Station. And you can actually catch a live rocket launch from the center's rooftop or bleacher viewing areas. The best part? It's absolutely free, so pack your astronaut gear, grab your binoculars, and head over to that place. Those were fantastical destinations that could help you feel closer to space without leaving Earth. You can read more about them in the book titled Space Age Adventures, over 100 terrestrial sites and out-of-this-world stories. This list includes astronaut training facilities, captivating museums brimming with space artifacts, mountaintop observatories, bustling spaceports, and awe-inspiring NASA centers. Ignite your imagination and set you off on an interstellar journey of your own.